just a reminder, if you are listening to this on Tuesday, November 3rd, the day that we are releasing this episode, it is election day. It is more important than ever that your vote counts. Mm -hmm. So go out there and vote. Show up in person if you haven't mailed in your ballot in advance. Yeah. Wear a mask, stay protected, go and vote. Mm -hmm. Real? Make your voice heard. There are probably going to be people there with the intent to intimidate you. Um, know your rights, know how to protect yourself, and stay safe, stay resilient, and know that you are doing the work that the ideas of our broken, sick, hurting country were founded on, and that you have a power to help reclaim it and make it what it always should have been. I want to go on and say that I don't put this all over Facebook or any of my social media. I am a first-time voter this year, and it's more important than ever, I feel, for those of us who haven't voted in the past to get out there. Honestly, I'm very disappointed in myself that this has been my first year. I had moved around so much that it was really hard. And mm -hmm. voting is one of those things that you don't learn in school, like how to get your ballots and how to go and do the process. So I took way longer than I should have to figure it out as an adult. There is no excuse not to vote. Yep. And even if, you're like, even if you're like Jesse and you've moved around a lot, many states do have same day registration, which means that even if you aren't registered as of today, Tuesday, November 3rd, you can register today, show up at the polls today and make yourself be counted. I had no idea about that. And I think that's information that needs to be out there more. Absolutely. Show up, vote, mm -hmm. and let your voice be heard. And I know things are potentially going to get pretty scary and we love you guys and stay safe um, mentally and emotionally. Hug your loved ones that you're bubbling with and just be good to each other. Just be good to each other. Vote and be good to each other. And welcome to supposedly. supposedly we're probably off that time but i don't even care it sounded right in real time so we'll hope for the best yeah we shall see so what's been new with you rue i'm home i'm in germany again uh oh, welcome very... back to germany oh sorry cat on the microphone hi um, cat cat in the i know i just i can't get them nope. out of the way nope yep all right so you're back in germany i How am everything went well um, yeah, as well as could be expected. I'm very tired and jet lagged and I don't really have a concept of time. It's like 11 p.m. and yeah, I've slept oh. off and on all day and yeah. Oh, it's 11 p.m. for you? I'm so sorry. I'm making you do this at 11 p.m. It's okay. That's why I was like, oh yeah, we can, we can push it later. <laughs> That's fine. I'm sorry. I got called in to work unexpectedly and I owed someone a solid. So I like had to go and I was only there for a couple hours and then I dropped my ballot off and everything. So it hey. wasn't that bad. But... Yeah. No. Uh, so when this comes out, it will be election day. Good luck. Godspeed. Go vote. Um... And be safe, because things could get kind of crazy. Yeah, absolutely could get kind of crazy. Um, okay, well, I bought myself a little present. Oh, is it the $19,000 eBay ring you showed me last night? No, but we are going to talk about that. Oh, okay, awesome. Um, no, I bought myself a piece of coal from the Titanic. Ooh, very fancy. Yeah. It was recovered from an expedition in either like 1993 or 1994, somewhere in there. Nice. Um, yeah, it's it's about an inch long. Comes with a certificate of authenticity. Ew. Like I know, I know when I buy myself treats, it's kind of like weird stuff. I'm surprised I haven't gotten haunted yet. I'm very surprised you haven't gotten haunted because you're always a little bit looking for it. 
Like, with your fascination with haunted dolls. Don't victim blame here. Oh, I'm not victim blaming. That's like saying if I wear a a crop top, I'm asking for it, you know? (laughs) No, because... If I'm looking for a historical item, I'm gonna get haunted. No, because it's not a historical item. It's literally like Ethel the doll who says, friendly ghost spirit attached, kind of almost killed my husband, but she's really nice. (laughs) And you're like, I must have her. Ethel is my new best friend. I have never bought one. I do own Neolithic quartz beads. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I own mummy beads taken from an ancient Egyptian tomb. All this stuff sounds really impressive, but it's actually not that impressive if you go on eBay. You can usually pick up <laughs> the stuff for like under 30 bucks. And I own a Bronze Age Viking ring that was worn by an actual Viking lady. And uh, now I got a piece of coal from the Titanic, so. And so I, I want to point out that none of your actual acquisitions or purchases are that scary, which is how I'm not victim blaming. Yeah. But it's, it's the fact that every time we do like an eBay segment, you're like, I want to buy the ghost his and hers Victorian chairs that have ghost dad and mom sitting in it. I want to buy okay, Ethel the spooky see doll. see how I cool wanna, they were looking? <laughs> you want the mirror, you want the doll, you want, like, that's where it's not victim blaming. It's literally advertising, hey, bad things will happen to you. And you're like, mm, but I still kind of want it. But I never buy them. They just, just like, why do all the cool looking items have to be haunted? Is all I'm saying. Like there was a mirror. I was so into this mirror, she and I'm like, so it's probably haunted. I'm. It's probably haunted. Wasn't it also um, like four grand? Yeah. Usually the expensive things that I really want are, which will bring us back to pirate party okay. part two. Pirate party part two. Let's do it. Okay. So, uh, to continue our countdown of the most popular. Halloween costumes of all time. And this yep. is of all time. This isn't just like this year. Right. Um, we've got five. Zombies. Four. Pirates. Three. Superheroes. Two is what we're about to do. I was like, I didn't study for that part. Yeah. Number no. two. That's number where we're two. At now. Yes. Pirate Party Part 2 will take place with our number one item. But before that, we are going to do number two, which is vampires. But, you know, we've done a lot of great stories. So I'm going to throw a little something unconventional at you due to my eBay search histories that we've talked about. I'm going to tell you today why 90% of vampire hunting kits are bullshit. Ooh. Okay. So here we go. (laughs) <laughs> All right, so when you think of a vampire kit, killing kit, what what would you think would probably be in that? Um, so I have a huge fascination with vampires, and I've actually looked at a lot of these and also saw a oh. weird segment on Pawn Stars about them. Oh, <laughs> so, did you? Okay. Yes, they were going to give them like $7, you know, because Pawn Stars. But I know that like crucifixes are a big one, holy water is often a big one, wooden stakes are often kind of your your buffy essentials your run-of-the-mill yeah. essentials yeah what if i told you that most of those things weren't really even in vampire lore so to speak oh obviously to be popularized until the 50s or the 70s yep that would check because out that's the truth so in the victorian era people did have vampire killing kits mm-hmm. and these kits were usually ornate or what we would consider ornate today back then was probably just like yeah it's like a caboodle um <laughs> antique boxes i just want a vampire killing caboodle now i can make you one i'm okay. sure that's what buffy had <laughs> with like little stickers yeah some stickers this is my murder caboodle (laughs) so back to victorian times it'd be an ornate wooden box Mm -hmm. usually lined with some sort of velvet and there would be some implements into it it would usually be carried on the back of a carriage um for anyone traveling kind of through europe right uh, you were in danger of being killed by vampires. But a lot of the kits contained things that we don't even see until like the 50s, 60s, 70s. So a lot of museums have vampire killing kits on display, which is really interesting considering most of them aren't authentic at all. Right. In reviewing vampire killing kits online, a lot of the recent ones had some even strange things in them. Can you take a guess of what a weird thing that'd be in a vampire killing kit? Oh, man. Uh, so going in the theme of the caboodle, maybe some of the plastic butterfly clips made popular by, like, the Lizzie McGuire era. 
<laughs> Which, by the way, if you want to play a drinking game that'll get you drunk, take a drink every time Lizzie McGuire or her mom has clips in their hair. You will be wasted 10 seconds in. And that's called Don't cirrhosis that. of the liver. That actually may be my election night <laughs> drinking game. Butterfly clips? Yeah. I may it'll, just watch it'll I, do it for you. I may just watch Lizzie McGuire all night on election night and just drink. That is totally fair. Mm -hmm. So in one of these most recent vampire killing kits, I found things like garlic powder. Okay. What are you going to do? Are you going to like pour it in your hand and like blow it into their eyes? It's so spicy. It burns. And I smell like pasta sauce. Mm. Um, So a lot of the antique kits had things much in the realm of a spade for digging up a vampire. They would have large knives, sometimes pistols, silver bullets, okay. but usually did not include stakes because mm-hmm. staking a vampire didn't really come into popularity until much later. Mm-hmm. And that, my friends, is why 90% of the vampire killing kits you will see, whether it be on Etsy or eBay or anything, are... Oh, phony. So I didn't know you were looking for me. Yeah. yeah. Or- Bullshit. Yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. Sorry, that was kind of a short segment, but I wanted to save as much time as possible for Pirate Party Part 2. Okay, let's do it. I like the little sprinkle. The the sprinkle of garlic powder, if you will. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, so uh, people who are just tuning in now uh, might get caught up. I really do recommend that you go back and listen to our episode Pirate Party. Mm -hmm. I thought it was freaking fantastic. Rue and I made this treatment that hopefully will someday be a movie, in my opinion. Um... So we had cast James Franco as Sam yep. Bellamy. Mm-hmm. We had cast Jonah Hill as Blackbeard in the story. Yep. We had Seth Rogen as Paul Graves. Mm-hmm. And we had a couple other fun Will Ferrell well. was the midlife crisis guy. Prince. Yeah. No. No, no Paul, Paul Graves was midlife oh, crisis. Sorry. Yes. It's been a couple weeks. Uh, there is a lot of New England lore about Marie Hallett. And what happened to her after Sam Bellamy kind of sails away. So the thing about women of this time is they're not always the best documented throughout history. Um, If you are not someone of great means as a woman, there's a really good chance that you wouldn't be documented at all. Um, If you had gone on trial for something, sometimes you would be documented for that and sometimes you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Women were kind of an invisible force through history until they were able to read and write on their own. That being said, Maria's story takes many different paths, and there's no real clear answer on if any of this is even true. When we go through the historical records trying to find any mention of her or her family, where we are able to locate some families by the name of Hallett in the area of Cape Cod, we are not actually able to find any solid records on Maria. Okay. Her reputation precedes her. So there are a lot, there are about three different versions of her story. And I'm going to tell this to you, and I'll be sure to tell you my favorite. As we know, Sam and the crew of the Witta Galley sunk mm-hmm. and when he was trying to return to Cape Cod. Many people think that perhaps he was trying to return to his true love, Goody Hallett, who he had left before. Mm-hmm. But let's rewind. Let's go back to that night of passion and him asking for her mom and dad's hand in marriage. Blah, blah, blah. When, he was denied, blah, blah, blah. when he was denied, he set off at sea. But Maria's life went on. In fact, that night of passion they shared led to the birth of a child. Oh. Yeah. Maria was found to be with child shortly after. And in some versions of the story, she was outcast immediately for that birth. Mm -hmm. Um, So Maria gets outcast and sent away. And she's kind of forced to have this baby on her own because she was a mother bearing her child out of wedlock. Yeah. So she has her child, and what is said is that the baby was dead. Many people in town thought that she had killed the child Mm -hmm. due to witchcraft or because she wanted a chance to get back into society. And some others say that she was just stillborn, but because of the crime of having birthed a child out of wedlock, people looked at her negatively. So a bunch of men in town grabbed Maria, still mourning over the loss of her freshly born baby. Mm Mm-hmm. And they pull her into the town square where she's been whipped and take it to jail immediately. Lovely. Yeah. So she's imprisoned and that's where it said that she starts to go insane in one of the versions of the story. So she kind of starts to lose her mind. And every day men would come by and heckle her 
townspeople were just spitting on her name and her family's name. And that's when the devil appears to her. So basically the devil appears and he says, look, all of this is due to this guy that Mm -hmm. got you pregnant and left you. Where is he right now? And he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. Being the good devil that I am. Right, sure. I will allow you to get vengeance on all you seek if you give me your soul. Sounds like a good deal, right? Is what he's thinking. Yeah, one for one. It's cool. One for one, whatever. Um, So it's said that that night in the jail cell, she strikes a deal with the devil for vengeance. Now, remember, she's cold. She's lost a lot of blood. She's been whipped. She's lost her good name. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the the jail kind of becomes overcrowded, and she's old news. They couldn't really prove she was a witch, but they all called her it. So they're kind of just like, whatever, go on your way. Yeah. So she starts doing all these menial jobs and tasks. And eventually, she's able to kind of afford a little shack where it said that she lived through the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. So Maria was often seen walking the shore and cursing at the ocean. And it said that she was cursing Sam Bellamy for leaving her. Mm. In fact, people say that the very night that the Witta Galley sunk, she was out there convening with the devil, dancing and cursing the ship in its name. Some legends of the story say that when the ship sunk, Sam Bellamy's body as well as a treasure chest washed ashore and she was able to keep the treasure and buried it on her property somewhere. Nice. Others say, eh, Probably not. Probably not. And as we know, the Wittig Alley was recovered, and it, most treasure was accounted for with right. as much records as pirates kept of all mm-hmm. of their plunder. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is version one. Nice. What's version two? Version two is that Sam Bellamy was, in fact, very much in love with Maria and intended to marry her. Mm -hmm. And Maria intended to marry him. But when it was found that she was pregnant, once again, she's cast out of her family's home. Right. Um, She's found to have delivered the baby, which unfortunately did not survive. And in the second version, once again, she's thrown in jail. Mm -hmm. So eventually she gets kind of kicked out of the jail. And that's when she decides to go and set up the shack and start doing menial tasks. It it follows very much the same time. Okay, yeah. Um, so she's doing these menial tasks and eventually she kind of becomes a good witch and that's how she gets the name Goody Hallett, Maria oh, Goody Hallett. Okay. It's because she starts assisting in the birth of children, um, little bits of charms, stuff like that, just right. to make a small increments of money. Mm-hmm. And the townspeople at this point kind of overlook it. Yeah. Um, and in this version, she spends the rest of her life waiting every night for the ship to arrive. Hmm. It's very sad. It is. It's not very long either. Okay. So what's version three? There's probably actually like a thousand versions of this. Well, probably, yeah. Okay. So I should also mention that today there's a meadow in Wellfleet where she was said to live known as Goody Hallett Meadow. And that's Uh the property that supposedly this treasure was buried on and that she, the final version once again, kind of follows the same path of the first Mm -hmm. two, which tells me to some degree that there might actually be a historical element to this because a lot of the versions start out the same way. So Mm -hmm. having that much overlap means like something when, when each story has like the same fragment, you feel like there's something. Right. There is a lot of dispute whether she killed the baby or whether the baby was stillborn. You know, it was the 1700s right? So yeah. the baby very well could have been stillborn or yeah. for many different reasons. Um, or, and I like to think that that was the case because she mm-hmm. does seem to really mourn the loss of this child throughout her entire life. Yeah. Um, in these stories. So version three is that once again, Maria is left impregnated by Sam. She's very much in love with him. Mm-hmm. She delivers his baby. The baby is unfortunately deceased. She's weeping over the body in the barn of her parents' house when she's discovered. Okay. The town's assume that she's a witch and has murdered the baby. Really, it was just a crime to be an unwed mother. She had tried to hide and disguise the pregnancy until he returned. But as we know, Sam Bellamy never did. did. Yeah. So they drag her to jail and she spends a little time in there. And instead of making a deal with the devil, she does her time. And when she's released, once again, we end up in the shack where she's doing these menial tasks. Mm-hmm. She's, she's um, 
doing a little bit of witchcraft and also other stuff as well. And it said that the night of the storm, she's on the beach, walking the beach alone, waiting for her lost love, Sam Bellamy, to return. When the ship is sunk, but his body washes ashore and that they just kind of ride off into the sunset together. Hmm. It's very so, sad. It's all very star crest. It is. It's incredibly star-crossed to think that this is happening. Her life is going on while he's out at sea trying to make this fortune. Mm -hmm. Now, historical records, once again, 1700s, not always that accurate. And we've got a lot of people that would go by family names. So it's very easy to get people mixed up as well. Mm -hmm. So in some records, it's even believed that Sam Bellamy had a wife in Europe and a son. And we're going to talk about that a little bit because in, in 2018, a bone fragment was found next to a pistol engraved with his name in the sunken wreck okay so and you're gonna uh, buy it on ebay god i wish (laughs) (laughs) and okay so our archaeologist friend that discovered him so barry clifford okay so our buddy barry clifford finds the wreck of the wyatta and after exploring this wreck many many times in 2018 a small bone fragment is found along with a pistol bearing Sam Bellamy's name. Now, I should also mention that this wreck, the Witta Galley, is known as the largest pirate graveyard that we have found to date. There's a lot of pirate remains still down there of his crewmen Hmm. and potentially Sam Bellamy. So this Englishman from Devon around the same time comes to the Witta Galley Pirate Museum with documents that shows that he's descended from black Sam Bellamy. But once again, documents around that time are kind of and who can really claim paternity right it's kind of anyway so they decide hey let's run a dna test on sam bellamy's bone fragment that we found they're 100 okay. percent sure it's sam bellamy let's just go ahead and confirm it mm-hmm. well dna turns out negative it was not sam bellamy's bone fragment so who's to say hmm. that maria and sam didn't actually run away together that's my favorite version. However, in reality, he definitely went down with the ship because mm-hmm. Sam Bellamy, as we discussed before, was the prince of pirates. He very right. much honored his crew. And it was a disgraceful thing for a pirate yeah. pirate captain or any captain to survive a shipwreck that yeah. your ship went down. The captain always goes down with the ship. Yeah, I do like the idea though, that they ran away together and at least got to enjoy so, a little bit of life. And I don't know, this guy, maybe it was Sam Bellamy's bone that was found, and this is just not actually a legitimate heir of Sam Bellamy. Yeah, we don't know. That's because also true. documents at that time were so very confusing. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of people in towns would have the same name, and it was very right. hard to find. Um, and I know that Pirate Party Part 2 isn't as exciting as the <laughs> thrilling, plundering adventure that we created for you in Pirate Party Part 1, but the fact that the good... The Hallett legend has existed on Cape Cod for as long as it has. Yeah. Really speaks to a community sense of lore and right. the stories that we can create and pass down for generations to come. It's really cool that there's still like the meadow named after her. Yeah. And they believe that that's, that's actually the land that the Hallett family owned. That's cool. Um, I can't tell you how many times it frustrates me in trying to research women. Mm-hmm historically that you just hit that dead end wall because yep. until they could read and write, mm-hmm. unless you were really very publicly put on trial for witchcraft and hung for it or, yep. or your marriage was, your wedding was such a big affair that it was a socialistic, socialite affa- socialistic, socialite <laughs> affair. Yeah. Um, you really kind of didn't exist in the history books at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe a birth notice. Maybe. But that's if you knew the maiden name. I mean, it, it's all so patriarchal. Right. That's the other thing is... Uh, like, if you don't know who the father was to even look at the birth notices, there were a million Sarahs or Martha or, like, you know, just those four basic names kind of that rotate in early American history. You're absolutely. not going to find it. So It's going to be really tough. So there's actually a really great book that I would like to recommend Awesome for any, any of those out there, any of our listeners who want to learn more about Goody Hallett mm-hmm. or the legends surrounding her and the history of the legends. The book is by Kathleen Brunnell and it's called Bellamy's Bride, The Search for Maria Hallett of Cape Cod. Nice. 
And it'll tell you a lot about the different versions of the lore, where we think the history came from, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for something with a little bit more fiction in it, there are a lot of books along the lines of Maria Hallett, The Witch of Wellfleet, where you can check out. And East Ham, A Love That Did Not Die. Very nice. Yeah. Well, sweet. So, witches is the number one costume. It's sad that they never got there happily ever after, most likely. But at least we do know a little bit more about her, and she wasn't just a complete plot device for our boy Sammy. Absolutely. Now, what if I told you you could go on eBay, and if you had enough money, you could own a ring or a piece of gold that was discovered from that Spanish treasure fleet that they had originally sought to plunder, but were turned away from. I mean, I would tell you no, Jesse, just like I did at four in the morning when we last talked about this. I may have texted Rue at 4 a.m. about yep. this eBay listing. So I just think it's so cool that we can learn and we can research about these people. And then you can own something that there was their life pursuit. Mm-hmm. For only like $10,000, right? Uh, 19,500. 19, oh, excuse me. 19,500. It okay. is the, it goes for the buy it price, but you know, shipping's only 6620. So. Well, that's a steal at that point. It can get delivered to you by tomorrow, which Shoot. is nice. Yeah. So it's from the 1715 fleet and it's an amethyst ring with pirate gold coins and jewelry treasures. That's pretty dope. If I had an extra 20 grand, it would be yours. I really appreciate that. (laughs) I have like five (laughs) extra dollars. I'll send you a ring pop. (laughs) A ring pop? (laughs) Yep. That's the only ring you're getting from me, baby. That's okay. Hang on. I want to put my Viking ring on now. Okay. Yeah, you cannot buy any of Sam Bellamy's recovered treasure from from the Wood Galley. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That's a no-no. That's a no-no. Basically, the 1715 fleet and the Atocha is all you can get. Okay. Spanish gold-wise. I know, because I've looked. Because I, <laughs> if I had, like, an extra five grand, man, I'd have a doubloon here today. A doubloon. Yeah. Gold oh, my goodness. It would be my largest eBay purchase. I should think so. Instead, I get a piece of coal from the Titanic delivered here, like, in a week and a half. Cool. So, you ready to get sad? I mean, it's still 2020 and election day is tomorrow. I am already sad, my friend. All right. Well, let's keep that party rolling. Um, I didn't plan for this to be the election day episode, but, you know, we're here. So let's let's do it. What are you rolling on your face? A face roller. Okay. I guess that makes sense. Okay. So I had an allergic reaction pretty bad. To like, what? yesterday hay (laughs) hay is for horses well the day before yesterday i know it is but like i said we pranked my friend with my severed head oh shit where are the pictures oh i'll send them to you okay okay but they put a hay bale over my hay because over my head not over my hay (laughs) they put a hay bale over my head my actual head to Uh show kind of cover so it looked like someone had stashed my body in the hay bale and then we laid the head out in the middle of the barn well turns out very allergic to hay did not know that so i woke up yesterday morning and my eyes were like swollen almost shut and my face is really red and splotchy so the face roller is cold and it just feels nice okay i support that Sorry. Okay. No, you're good. It just looks kind of like a cheese grater from here. Like one of the like Olive Garden, like cranky kinds. <laughs> and that's why I was like, why are you rolling a cheese grater on your face, Jesse? No, it's a, it's a face roller. Okay. It's cold on the face that still kind of hurts. There you go. I've just been doing it throughout the day to make it not itch. Okay. Well, gosh, if your face hurts, maybe you should take some Tylenol. Are we going to talk about the Tylenol poisoning? We are oh yeah let's go back to the 80s strap in strapping all right thanks for that great segue by the way i wasn't really sure how to open that up but you you clinched it for me i'll That's tell good. you how you open it up you hey, open face. it up without a safety seal you do anybody can open that up all right so on september 29th 1982 12-year-old Mary Kellerman from Elk Grove Village, Illinois, woke up with a sore throat and runny nose. 
She stayed home from school and her parents gave her an extra strength Tylenol. Mary went into the bathroom to take it with some water and almost immediately collapsed to the floor and was rushed to the emergency room where she was pronounced dead before 10 a.m. Oh, I didn't know it started with a 12-year-old. Yeah. This story's pretty rough. So at 3.15 that afternoon in a nearby suburb, Mary Lynn Weiner, or Weiner, I'm not 100% sure, is at home after giving birth to her fourth child. So essentially my hero, because that sounds like a lot. Yeah. Right. So the hospital had sent Mary Lynn home with some Tylenol. She took two capsules and moments later collapsed and died. Wait, the hospital sent her home with it? Yep. Oh. Man, I know that when you've just delivered a baby or you're nursing or you're pregnant, Tylenol is one of the main things they tell you to take for any aches and pains. Yeah. Yep. So that's what the hospital sent her home with. This same afternoon, Adam Janis, a 27-year-old postal worker from the Chicago suburb of Arlington Heights, took a sick day from work, picked his kids up from school, and stopped at the Jewel drugstore on the way home to get some Tylenol since he was unwell. Adam then told his wife that he was going to go lie down. He took some of the Tylenol and a few minutes later came to the kitchen to try and get help from his wife. He is pronounced dead at 3.15 p.m. from what was suspected to have been a massive heart attack. Oh, my God. 27 years old. So this is where it just really gets super tragic for me. So Adam's family comes back to their family home after his death at the hospital to just kind of grieve and cope and start making arrangements for the funeral. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being that they're all crying and very emotional, uh, Adam's brother Stanley suffers from chronic back pain and he asks his wife Teresa to go get him some Tylenol from the medicine cabinet in the bathroom because all all of the stress is really making his back seize up. Right. And when you cry, you get headaches and, ugh. And so Teresa gives him the Tylenol and decided since the bottle was out, she would take some as well for her headache, like you said, from all the crying. No. Both Stanley and Teresa collapse within minutes and are rushed to the hospital. Stanley's pronounced dead that evening and Teresa at 1.15 in the morning overnight. So we've got (sighs) three deaths in the same household in one day. And from the bottle of Tylenol. But we don't know that yet. Right, because it's the 80s. Because it's the 80s, and, yeah. And Dr. House isn't on the case. He would have given spinal taps out lickety split. He would have He would have had somebody search that house. It's not lupus, I promise you that much. Not this time. <laughs> so 31-year-old Mary McFarland of Elmhurst, Illinois, told her coworker she had a headache, took some Tylenol, and within minutes loses consciousness. She's pronounced dead that night. The next day... Police so go, wait, wait, yeah, how yeah, many yeah, people yeah. is that at this time? Um, one, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six. Six people? Six or seven, yeah. Ugh. Yep. All right. So the next day, police go to the apartment of 35-year-old flight attendant Paula Prince, who hadn't been heard from and hadn't showed up for work in a few days. Um, Paula was always really diligent about showing up to work. Like I said, she was a flight attendant, so her job was really critical that, you know, she needed to show up. It wasn't like her to just not go to work. So the police do this welfare check, and they find Paula's body lying next to her vanity, upon which an open bottle of Tylenol was sitting. Oh. And this is where we get into, like, the heart of true crime. So a few days prior to finding her body, Paula had gone to Walgreens to pick up some Tylenol, and she can be seen on a security camera CCTV footage at the drugstore in line holding this bottle of Tylenol. In the photo from the security camera, there's a man visible behind her, and he appears to be watching her. And police assume that this is the suspect. No, I didn't know that. Oh, I know a yeah. Little, I know enough about this case like yep. the notes but i a man yeah it's, i didn't it's know super, that, that super haunting video. yeah so public health nurse of arlington heights helen jensen is going to be one of our heroes of this story fantastic love a good nurse hero love a good nurse hero so helen begins to investigate wondering why so many people in this small area are dying in a similar fashion they all just seem to be dropping like flies Oh my God, you go girl. Right? And she was like, this, this doesn't feel right to me. She is our doctor house. Yes. So she went to the Janice household where the three people had died in the same way within a day. And she pointed to the Tylenol being the cause, noting that they were easily tampered with since under the cap was just a wad of cotton to keep moisture out. So she takes the bottle to the hospital to compare it against like a control sample. But of course, no one believes her. 
Because she's a woman. She demanded it be investigated, but the investigators were hesitant. Until our other hero of the story, Cook County investigator Nick Pichos, further explores the Tylenol and found that all the control numbers in the bottles of homes where people had died were the same, meaning they were all produced at the same time. Okay, all right, all right. Yep, so yep, it yep. took a man? It took a man. Mm-hmm. Saying, well, huh, yeah, seems like a good thing to check into. I mean, yes, but the thing is, is that being just a public health nurse, she didn't have access necessarily to do to like, investigations right. like that. And so it was more um, Nick P. Show saying, you know what, I think this Helen gal is onto something. Let's look into it. So it was more someone in the department listening. But yeah, it's pretty fucked up that it took a dude. But anyways, so Nick P. Show tells the medical examiner named Donna Hugh that he was kind of suspecting that these bottles with the same uh, control numbers had something to do with these deaths. Okay, so question. Yeah. The last name Donahue or a woman named Donahue? Last name Donahue. Okay, just yeah. to clarify. Yep, um, is the medical examiner. I couldn't find a okay. first name. And so the medical examiner tells Nick P. Shows to smell the bottles. That sounds like a terrible idea. Hey, if they're all poisoned, let's go ahead and smell them all. All right, and what do you smell? So Nick P. Shows smells the delightful smell of almonds. And my true crime people are screaming at me right now because they will recognize that as the scent of cyanide. Oh, cyanide smells like almonds. Cyanide smells like almonds. Interesting. And so Pichos reports to the examiner, he's like, it kind of smells like, I don't know, almonds. Okay, do not go smell cyanide. Yeah, I, I recommend you don't. But if you get served a dish that shouldn't smell like almonds and it smells like almonds... And your life insurance policy just got bumped up. Don't eat it. (laughs) Very good note. Yeah. Uh, Anyways, so Donahue tells Nick that he is actually super lucky that he picked this up because only about half the population can smell cyanide. Kind of like smelling a skunk. Once again, don't go try to see if you're one of the half of the population that can smell cyanide. So after exploring these bottles, it was discovered that the Tylenol was laced with potassium cyanide at a high enough dose for each capsule to kill thousands of people, which is why the deaths happened within so moments. So fast, yes. But thank God they happened fast and wasn't a... Right, but like a little bit of cyanide, if you get to the hospital immediately, you can live through that. But this was enough to drop like a thousand people per pill. And most wow. people are taking two or three. Right. If a headache, you're an adult, you take two or three Tylenol, you're good. So it's believed that the perpetrator purchased this Tylenol, tampered with it by opening the capsules and replacing the powdered medication with cyanide and then returning it to the different stores. And this is also like kind of messed up. So it's the capsules, which you can super easily break apart. And it's- Question. Yeah. Okay. But you said they all had serial numbers. That Mm -hmm. means they're made around the same time. Right. So they were all getting shipped out to these different places at the same time, or is there a chance that- these could have been done in the factory. It's very unlikely they were done in the factory because it seems like they were all shipped to one store, purchased, and then taken back, put on the shelf sneakily at different stores. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Like it would have been one to... shipment to Walgreens, but we've got them at the Jewel. We've got them at the Walgreens. Right. Them in different we, locations. We of... Yeah. Okay. All right. Got it. They yep. were purchased elsewhere and then returned. Yeah. And so the... and they just put that back on the shelves. They didn't even. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Well, because it's not even necessarily that someone, like, took it back to the customer service desk. They could have just been like, do, 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 and, like, set it on the shelf in front of the other bottles. Oh, that's true, too. Right. So um, they didn't necessarily, yeah. Right. Wow. And another messed up thing is, like, at this time, the, the quick release was a, a new thing. People were super excited about it. And the commercials even showed, like, the pill po- or the capsule popping apart and the powder falling out. Like, it was, right. a, it was a new patented thing. Like, ooh, these break apart so easily in your tummy and you'll feel better oh. in minutes. Which, like, could have planted the idea um, to commit this crime. So, Johnson & Johnson immediately began to recall all Tylenol nationwide, totaling to 31 million bottles, which estimated over $100 million of Tylenol wow. disposed of. And Did people- they find any more that were laced? I don't think they really tested it. I think they were just like, well, yeah, that'd be a lot of bottles. To yeah. So people started to panic. The Chicago police actually drove through the streets with loudspeakers to warn people not to take Tylenol at the request of the Johnson and Johnson manufacturer. Wow. Which is probably the most ethical a major brand has been in history. All 
right. We're going to give a couple props to Johnson and Johnson. Today. Right. Because yeah, well they done in the nineteen eighties Tylenol incident. They straight up lost like over a hundred million dollars, which is huge. Imagine how many more potential lives could have been lost. Oh, a hundred percent. They hadn't done that. A hundred percent. Yeah. But like also this ruined their reputation for a long time. Like Tylenol kind of fell off for a while because it was, oh, remember Tylenol killed all those people. Right. And so like they substantially took a hit in their brand, which is why I'm like, good job with your ethics. So during this time, we start to see profiling happening more and more. And so they created a suspect profile for the Tylenol killer. Okay. And this profile was a man in his 20s, a loner with some kind of knowledge of science, but one who is not considered successful in life. They think he may have done it for attention, could have a vendetta against Tylenol or the parent company Johnson & Johnson, or was targeting one of the victims specifically and had killed the others to mask the motive of the true crime. Interesting. Do you know how they got at that? Because isn't, aren't women the ones that tend to poison more? Yeah, I'm not sure how they necessarily thought that. And also, yes, women poison more, but women don't kill people. Women would never do a serial killing. Yeah, but, like, poison is usually more of a woman's MO. Yeah. True fact. Yeah, no, absolutely. Statistically, women poison more than men. But I think it's also looking at that this isn't, like, a kill-your-husband situation. This isn't in the mashed potatoes. It being a serial killer, I think, kind of changes the MO a little bit. I mean, could. Yeah. No, I'm not discounting it. Let's not rule it out. Oh, right. But this is the 80s. We're talking about the police here. So, I mean, I get the video, too, showed the guy behind her that was watching her. But I, I also know. know, as a woman, when you're in public, sometimes guys just watch you. Oh, yeah. I don't know that they had connected no. the, the man staring quite yet at okay. this point in the case. So, moving forward, a man wrote a letter to the manufacturer demanding a million dollars to stop the killing and included bank routing information. Oh, like, okay. All okay, right. calm right. down. Gotcha. I see where we're getting the man from. Then. Police traced the letter back to a tax consultant who'd actually been charged with murder in Kansas City years earlier. What, what kind of murder? Fun little hometown. Uh, so a body was found in his attic. Okay. But the body was found without a warrant, and so the whole case was thrown out. Oh. Because American legal system be like that. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And so this wow. guy. Yeah, so they're like, obviously this is a person of interest. Right. And so they interview him, and he told the police how a killer might commit these crimes, but he was never charged. All right, so how might a killer might commit these crimes? Well, I mean, pulling open the capsules and putting cyanide in. Yeah, I feel like that's a pretty basic thing to figure out, though. So. So he wasn't charged because it was ultimately proven that this man just wanted to embarrass his boss and frame him. The bank routing information was actually uh-huh. to his boss's account. He was totally okay. trying to set him up and frame him. And so he <laughs> wasn't charged for the crimes, but he was ultimately charged with extortion. Fair. Fair. Yep. Yep. In 2019. Oh, I would love to see the look on the boss's face when he found out he was implicated. Oh, in no doubt. Murders. No right? doubt. For what? real. Yeah. Well, you're fired. (laughs) Literally. Uh, All right. In 2009, the Tylenol investigation was reopened when Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, became a person of interest. But his MO is so different. Okay, but listen, because there's like some hella conspiracy theories that I could get way more into, but I'm going to kind of gloss over. All right, yeah, sum it up for me. I mean, I know, wasn't he have some sort of background in chemistry? Well, just, just listen. Okay, all right, all right. So the area that Kaczynski is from is the epicenter of all the drug stores where the tampered Tylenol was found. Okay. He's smack dab in the middle. All right. He was interested in committing mass murder. In his manifesto, he talked about a distrust of drug manufacturers and wanting to make the public have a distrust for them as well. Oh, okay. Part of what strengthens this hypothesis is that the name Wood and types of Wood are big in the Unabomber's world, and he had victims with the last name of Wood, gave aliases like such and such Wood who lives on Pine Street. Like, he was really into trees and Wood and stuff, which I didn't know. So, get this. Yes. The founders of Johnson & Johnson... Uh-huh. Were Robert Wood Johnson and James Wood Johnson. The, oh, okay. Um, I know this shouldn't pop in my head. Okay. But Full House Joey stuffed puppet. What? Uh, Jesse, I need you to cut it out. <laughs> okay. Just saying. <laughs> he seemed obsessed with wood, so. Yeah. 
hundred <laughs> percent. It was Uncle Joey, the Unabomber. <laughs> no, the the puppet. Okay, sure, it was the puppet. He was sentient. <laughs> this is now a Goosebumps book. The eighties, anything can happen. Anything can happen. So it's when yeah. Gremlins was out. <laughs> hey, I love Gremlins. It's great. Yeah, who doesn't? Right. Okay, but yeah, so it's kind of weird that, like, the Unabomber doesn't like drug companies, wanted to plant seeds of distrust, has this obsession with the name Wood. Was and obsessed then, with Wood. Okay. Period. Yeah. Um, all right, so now we're going to yeah. go back to the security photo with Paula Prince. The man kind of okay. looks like Ted Kaczynski. In as much of how you can tell who no someone way. might be in gritty 1980s CCTV, kind of looks like from Ted from an Kaczynski. 80s video camera. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, I right. mean, yeah. So, okay. that's kind of our Did he lead. ever admit to it? Mm-mm, not, not as far as I know. Did he ever admit to the, the unibombings? I think so. Honestly, we should do Ted Kaczynski at some point, because I'm not as up to it. All right, I'll do that next. Be. Okay, sounds good. Okay. So, there were a few copycat killings, but nothing substantial and nothing that could provide any answers. It seemed like people who were just like, hmm, that worked pretty well the first time. I want some attention. And in May of 1983, so like six months later, or eight months later, I'm bad at math, Congress approved the Tylenol bill, which is why pills have tamper-proof seals. By 1989, the FDA made this a national requirement for all over-the-counter medication. All these years later, we still have no answers. So we still don't know? We still don't know who it was, but that's why we have tamper-proof packaging. Fun fact, they also released the caplets that they have now mm-hmm. that don't break apart as a reaction to that. They, they patented their fast-release yep. caplets. Yeah, because clearly the ones that pop apart weren't their best plan. Uh, just because this was kind of a deep dive, I want to thank Patch.com, Chicago Reader, PBS, My Favorite Murder, and, and That's Why We Drink. Because I definitely couldn't have done it without all of those sources. Fantastic. I would uh, like to thank Google. <laughs> always. First and foremost. Crimecapsule.com. Uh, the New England Historical Society's website. Nice. And The Independent. All right. For Goody Hallett's story. Heck yeah. And I'd like to thank Atlas Obscura for Does It Even Matter If These Vintage vi- Vampire Killing Kits Are Real? <laughs> and once again, very much summarize that one because we had a lot to fit in today. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. I have some news for you. Oh, tell me. Well, you know how we did our episode at Union Station? Yes. Well, I got called back. Okay. Apparently, things are popping off there paranormally. Ooh. They've had a lot of crazy incidences over the past week. Nice. And I've been called in to do another investigation tomorrow night. And um, we are going to do another paranormal investigation because things have just been insane. That's awesome. So, yeah, definitely stay tuned for that. Definitely. I mean, I can't wait for all the, all the details. Tip. Fantastic. Awesome. I look forward to it. And so should you. Next time on Supposedly. Supposedly.